31 years ago, Jim Simpson had an idea, and that was for the Birmingham International Jazz and Blues Festival. Jim, welcome to the programme. Does it seem 31 years ago that this all, <laughs> all crept through your mind one day? It seems like a lifetime ago, <laughs> rather more than 31 years. It was only supposed to be a, a one-day event to start with, but it, um, it got out of hand. What was the inspiration for, for it in the first place? Well, I'd sort of drifted away from my jazz roots and my blues roots and got involved with popular music. But at the same time, I listened to a lot of jazz. And in the 1980s, a lot of the jazz that was being popularised was not, to my mind, much, very much to do with jazz. It all came to a head when I went to a, um, a funded tour of a, a trombone player in his band, and he played the second set with his left trouser leg rolled up and his foot in a bucket of water. I didn't quite see the relevance of that to jump, jive and swing. Mm. Um, so I decided to, to put on a one-day event of uh, red-blooded jazz, using the best jazz players around in uh, Cannon Hill Park in the Arena Theatre. Where I put on, my opinion, in my opinion, the best 12 jazz players at the time, headed by Humphrey Littleton and Dig Digby Fairweather. Mm. And we attracted 850 people. We recorded it live for our Big Bear record label. We got Sunday Times Jazz Album of the Year, and it seemed like fun. I was approached by a local brewery um, saying, why don't we do a bigger one next year? I said, fine. They'd sponsored the one day. They said, we're thinking of a week or 10 days. <laughs> so I thought, well, that sounds fun. Yeah. Um, I was approached by a hotelier, who uh, was the old Holiday Inn with in Crown Plaza. He said, we're very quiet in July. Do it in July, and we'll get better occupancy. And uh, you can use my hotel as a base, which is very nice, very well, swish place. That's and it grew from there. Yeah. <laughs> so so from, from those humble beginnings, one day, and uh, 850 people. This year, how many days? Uh, 10 days. 10 days, and how many people do you think? We're, last year, we had nearly 91,000. Um, Goodness me. Yes, this, this year's 188 music performances, plus other things as well. Yeah. And we're aiming to top last year's figure. But a lot depends on the weather, because mm. almost all of the festival is free. And uh, people come out and circulate if, if, it's good, if the weather's good, as it was last year. This year, we're hoping for good weather. Have you dared to look at the long-term forecast? Have you even <laughs> asked about it? Or <laughs> I stopped doing that about 15 years ago. <laughs> Just yeah. drove, drives you crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, presumably now, instead of those 850 people who I'm guessing uh, 31 years ago all live locally, you're mm -hmm. attracting people from all over the world, I suspect. Yes, indeed. Yes, um, not not just the musicians who do come from all over the world, but we get f we get fans that come to obviously probably fans come to Britain anyway. But they put in two or three four days in Birmingham as part of their itinerary. Um, we had, I think it was two point something percent came from outside the UK last year, which was and all all good for the uh, for the city's economy, of course. Very much so. Especially the hotels. Yeah. Our hotel partner has been with us now for seven years. Um, they're obviously doing okay out of it, otherwise they wouldn't mm -hmm. remain a hotel partner. Yeah. Well, you said that you kind of thought that the man with his trouser rolled up and his foot in a bucket of ice was not really how you saw jazz. What, was, what were your inspirations in jazz then when you were a younger man? Well, I didn't really stand a chance because when my dad came back from and Second World War in the Middle East, he took me upstairs and took down these old Louis Armstrong records and Can Basie records and uh, I was eight years old at the time and I've had it. That was it, I was hooked. I started playing when I was 11. Um, I formed a jazz club at school when I was 12. Uh, when I was in the Royal Air Force, I was posted to Gibraltar and I formed a band there and uh, oh. it, it uh, just roller coasted. You mentioned Louis Armstrong. I saw a photograph once of you sitting in the front row watching Louis Armstrong perform. Tell us about that. Well, it was totally accidental. My, my father, who was a great jazz fan all his life, took um, me and my brother, and his best friend, and the butcher's daughter, who I was walking out with at the time, um, just to the Embassy Sports Drome to see the Louis Armstrong All-Stars. It was the great All-Stars with Tremmy Young and Arthur Shaw and Billy Kyle. And the opening acts was a one-legged, this is true, a one-legged tap dancer named Peg Leg Bates. And he'd spin on his bad leg and tap with his good foot and, and, and vice versa. And um, he was on a revolving stage. And the, the band came on stage and without Lewis and started playing the, the, the refrains of Sleepy Time Down South. And suddenly this incredible sound sounded about three feet from my right ear. And my jaw dropped and the Birmingham male photographer caught that moment. And there he was. Yeah. yeah. What, what was it like standing so close to your hero? Um, 
magical, magical. Mm. Yeah, still is. And uh, many people still a great admirer of him. Uh, for the moment, uh, Jim Simpson, thank you. We will um, we will talk some more about um, the Birmingham Jazz and Blues Festival. We mustn't forget the blues part of it. Uh, the festival starts on the 3rd of July, by the way. Uh, it's going to be a big boost for Birmingham musically, tourism-wise, everywise. So did you call it the International Festival right at the start? No, we, we were uh, told to call it International by the City Council. At that time, okay. they were calling it everything International, like, like a railway station, for instance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we, we, we've, we've dropped it this year, the International. Oh, right. Well, we figure we are international, and the, the program and the mm. visitors demonstrate that clearly. It doesn't seem necessary to trumpet it. it. We should be it rather than claim to be it. Was it just the Birmingham Jazz Festival right at the start? It was. Yeah, okay. And how, how difficult or easy was it to persuade people to, to come and play there then? Well, it was easy, really, because I'd, I'd known many of the guys in this country um, for, for years. I'd, I'd worked with them for years. Uh, I knew some of the Americans we got in at the beginning. Um, a very good friend of mine was a Yugoslav trumpet player called Dusko Gojkovic, and he lived in New York, and he got some of the better players for me. He put me in touch with Miles Davis, for instance, and we got Miles through, through, through Dusko, which is quite ironic, really, because um, Benny Green, the broadcaster, uh, who loved Dusko's playing, who wasn't too keen on Miles, um, said that Miles sounded like Dusko Gojkovic on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> who's the, who's the, the, the biggest names you've had here so far, then? Miles Davis, I, mm. I guess, uh, statue. Um, personally, I, I loved having the Blues Brothers Band, the one from the movie. Mm. We had six shows over three years with, with them. They, they were tremendous with Steve, Steve Cropper and Duck Dunn. That, that was mm. wonderful. Um, Can Basie, it's a big, beautiful band. Mm. Had three times, they're wonderful. We had the only ever appearance of um, Illinois Jacket, big band. Which, you know, only, uh, I think maybe the only UK appearance. He flew in from Paris. Mm. For our show at the, at the Much Missed Grand Hotel. I say Much Missed. Grand Hotel is intending to be part of our festival in 2018. And right. uh, they got involved this year support, supporting a few things, even though it's not actually open yet to hotel. Mm. Did you, uh, in those early days, I mean, did, was it really sort of just a nice, a nice day for you and, and your fellow <laughs> jazz players? I'm, I'm <laughs> suspecting it might have been in the, in the start. Well, it was in the planning stages, but when it got down to the log logistics, actually talked to business people, you know, they are mm. business people, they're a bit different from ordinary folk, it, was, it suddenly took on a whole different complexion. And uh, I wasn't too good at that to start with. I think I, I learned to punch my weight later on, but uh, we, we, we got ridden over a few times in the early years. What was the, or, um, possibly still is, the, the, the biggest and, and toughest thing about organising something like this? Well, of late, I've suddenly realised I've not had a summer since 1985. And that's mm. getting me down a little bit, but I, I guess when the music starts, I'll, I'll forget all, all about it. Um, I don't know, it's, it's another day, another problem. But I, don't, I quite like solving problems. When they're so, if they're not mm. solvable, it, it, mm. you can't do anything about it. It doesn't matter, but it's nice to be able to have a task and say, OK, let's mm. find a way around it. How important was it to you that there was a, a strong blues element to this as well as jazz? to differentiate between the two? Well, I'll go back a little way here. About 1968, 69, um, I managed Black Sabbath. I did the first two mm -hmm. albums with Black Sabbath, and then I lost them to a, a, a major London mm -hmm. company. I thought it was pointless finding a local band, building up to importance level, and then simply losing it, because it's, it's pretty much the way things were going in those days. So I decided to bring in some jazz players uh, for America, because that was my first love. And uh, I had Harry, Harry, Harry Sweets Edison lined up, the Can Basie trumpet player. And the, uh, I found it impossible to get work permits because the Musicians' Union insisted on exchanging what they call man days. So if I took a 12 piece band to UK for five days, that's 60 man days, and I had to book the same in America. So I turned to the blues. And because uh, I could bring them in on a variety of artists' contra uh, contract as a variety of artists' entertainers. And I brought in Lightning Slim, Whispering Smith, Homesick James, Snooky Pryor, Washboard Willie, Boogie Woogie Red all these old guys, so I had a, and recorded them, so I had a pretty strong blues background. So when the board said, hey, we need to broaden this out, we were a, a jazz and blues festival, but not by name. Mm. We, we had lots of, we had B.B. King, Albert King, Freddie King, Albert Collins, uh, Clifton Chenier, these great blues names coming in, but we weren't calling it a blues festival. Then John James, who's been on our board f for years, said, this, this, you've got to put blues in the title. So the title got longer, mm. and then since they put international in, so it got longer again. 
Uh, do, do you get people then coming to you now or getting in touch with you and saying, why haven't you invited Tony Taylor along? Yeah. The, 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 I, I daren't go out, well, I do, but I, I, every time I go to a venue during the jazz festival, someone comes up and mm. says, this is a great festival, but there's one thing. <laughs> Mm. There's always one thing they don't like. Are, are there some things that you, you've taken on board where somebody suggested a, a particular artist and you've thought, you've either been able to say, well, look, we have actually tried to get them and we can't, or you say, hey, that's a good idea, well, let's go with it. Yeah, lots of good ideas have, have come from, um, from, from the, the jazz going public. This year we've got a, a special session where we, uh, it's, it's called Tell Us What We Did Wrong and Tell Us What We Did Right. We're going to have a meeting at the end of the festival, everyone's invited, to come and do it all at once, on condition they don't bully me during the festival. This year. I suppose one of the things you've always got to balance uh, is quality versus quantity. Actually, that's not quite it. The, the quality is the first thing. If it doesn't reach a certain quality, we, we won't book it. I think there's no point in putting second-rate music in, fr in front of people. Um, the quantity is a funny thing. We don't really have too much control over that. People either come to us and say, hey, let's get on board, or they don't. Uh, this year, we, just, we, have, we suffered the cutbacks like everybody else. We had a huge cut in our, in our budget. We decided to limit the festival to 100 or 120 shows, um, as against 176 last year. Mm -hmm. Well, um, although we decided that, people said, hey, can we get on board? Can we get involved? And um, it's grown to 188 shows. <laughs> totally on its own, but yeah. I, th I think people knew that we, ha we had the council cutbacks, and uh, mm -hmm. there, was, there were 84 different groups of people, be it, be it a, a pub or or, um, or or the arts council, who funded us this year. Mm. So it, it's not as bad as it as it looked. Because that's one of the great things with with, with jazz and, and to some extent with blues that that you just get little groups of people in pubs and they play and they like the ambiance and, and they like all of it. They're not smoke-filled anymore, but there's still something about a group of jazz musicians in a pub, isn't there? It is indeed, and, and also, there's nothing wrong with the music. It's, it's, it, people probably don't hear enough of it um, these days to, to fall in love with it as, we, as my generation did, mm -hmm. but confronted with it, um, people seem to in, enjoy it qu quite spontaneously. Uh, our policy is to interrupt people's lives, to interfere with their daily routines, to uh, have jazz, sound of jazz and blues drifting around, around every, every street corner. And uh, it's a long way to go before we achieve that, but we're, we're, we're on track. What are your musical boundaries then? Not personally, but within the show. <laughs> I know you're talking about country music here, Bob. Uh, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I, I must admit, I'm a bit of a poser here. Um, I always tell people very grumpily that I hate country music, but there's some great, awesome, great country bands like Sleep at the Wheel and and uh, and uh, the great Charlie Daniels band, um, who I have great pleasure wor of working with. So if, it, if it's played right, if it's played properly, mm. it's hard to resist good music. I do find it hard to get into the more sort of highbrow music. So I have to be honest. Mm. Um, hard? No, impossible. That's the word I was looking for. Really? Yeah, must be something wrong with my genes. <laughs> So, so classical composers are not for you then? I think Chopin writes a nice tune here and there, mm. um, but basically no. It, it's it, you're either highbrow or lowbrow. I think mm. I'm lowbrow. Oh, I don't think I'd ever call jazz lowbrow. Oh, please, D yes. don't, don't ruin our image. <laughs> <laughs> you want? I mean, you must be getting people as well who, who get in touch with you all the time so that want to come and play now because they know about this this event. Yes, can I tell you two very short stories? Um, one of the greatest rock bands this city, this country ever produced, I think, was the Spencer Davis Group. Mm -hmm. Those hits they had, like Keep On Running, were, were wonderful. Founder member Pete York has been a friend of mine for years. In fact, he left my band to join Spencer Davis Group. I haven't forgiven him yet. Mm -hmm. um, he lives in Munich now. He's very successful. He's paying his own flight, his own accommodation to come back to Birmingham and pay for local rates during this festival. He's doing nine shows for us in, in, in 10 days, and he's all, all his own costs. There's a girl called Sarah Lenka, who's the leading Billie Holiday interpreter, s singer in France. She's... I'm going to have to stop you. I do apologise, Jim. We've got to go to a break. I'm being shouted at in my ear. See you in a couple of minutes. I've just got a little story we've got to tell you before the break, or rather Jim Simpson has, about Meg Richardson in Crossroads. Well, when she got sacked way, way back then, um, a friend of mine called William Buckley, who wrote for the Express and Star, later became one of Esther Ransom's presenters, uh, 
we put a song, a song to it called Meggy's Magic and uh, released it as a 45 and we, we arranged demonstrations outside the ATV building and lots of ladies of a certain age turned up and supported us. But the label was, it was on vinyl, the label was great, it's a picture of Meg with a center, with a spindle goes to the vinyl, it was like a bullet hole. <laughs> you see, Crossroads, it is magic. I want to just take you a little away from there to talk about you and pop music in the city of Birmingham because names like Spencer Davis and Stevie Winwood and Ozzy Osbourne um, come readily to mind and you know all these guys and you know all about their work and their origins, don't you? Um, well, yes, I grew up musically, I suppose, in the, in the city in the early 60s when really rock came of age. And I, I'm a great believer, I, I believe that Birmingham is probably the UK capital of rock and roll. We just don't shout about it like Liverpool and other places do. Mm -hmm. um, so the, it's, not, it's not just straight ahead rock. There's so many different areas of popular music. The Birmingham is, at one time, 1982, 83, four of the top six reggae bands, three of the top reggae, six reggae bands in the world came from Birmingham. All different. Musical Youth, Steel at Pulse, and of course UB40. Mm -hmm. All totally different areas of reggae. They all came from this one city at the same time, all charted at the same time. But people never step back and say, hey, that's from Birmingham. When I go to things like Medium, the music industry conference every year, people know me, older people know me from the Black, my Black Sabbath days when I managed Black Sabbath. And they say, always say, oh, I didn't know Black Sabbath came from Birmingham. We think the world knows that. They don't. Mm -hmm. we, we, need to, we need to do something about this. There has to be some yeah. point in the city centre which captures our rock heritage and presents it to the, to the, to the world, at the museum of some sort. We are well short of the watershed, so how much can we talk about Black Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne and people? <laughs> um, as long as you like. It's, it's, mm. They were very exciting and, uh, shall I say, interesting times. Mm. Um, it's, um, how did you meet them in the first place? When I stopped playing, when we had a hit with Locomotive, a song, a song called Rudy's in Love, and I stopped playing because I couldn't manage the band and play at the same time. Because in those days, travelling was terrible to get from here to Newcastle. It was, it was a six-hour schlap. Um, so I found myself my evenings free, and I found a band from uh, uh, Litchfield called Bakerloo Blues Line, which included three players that went on to play with bigger bands like Dave Clemson with Euro Heap and uh, John Heisman's Coliseum, and I couldn't get much, any work for them. So I rented the upstairs room of a pub called The Crown on Station Street in Birmingham, mm -hmm. uh, designated Tuesdays as Blues Days, called it Henry's Blues House, um, named after a rather glamorous Afghan hound which lived next door to me at, at the time. As you do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, and I presented the band. On the first night, a, a John Michael Osborne and an Anthony, I think it's Anthony James Iommi, were, became members of, the, of Henry's Blues House. I got to know them as people before they told me I had a band called Earth. They said, would I put them on an intermission spot, which I did. Mm -hmm. They forwent for, for the um, standard fee of five pounds in exchange for Henry's Blues House t-shirt each. And the first time they played there, mm -hmm. I liked them. I got on well with them. They asked me to manage them, which I did. After much argument, we name changed. And, As you uh, say, how did, how did they get from Earth to Black Sabbath? <laughs> well, they all liked the name Earth. I hated it. Because I, I like words like Birmingham, Blues, Black Sabbath, with explosive a letter at the beginning, Earth just sort of sneaks in and you, you don't notice it. But they loved it. And then I found not one, but two bands in London called Earth. And with that, I was able to persuade them to right. change their name. We dithered and argued for weeks over this. Then one day, um, Giza was late for, for a band meeting, and we did ha have band meetings. They weren't all hooligans. They were very serious young men about their music. We, we were all very serious about it, which is probably mm -hmm. why why, why we did so well. But at a band meeting, Giza was late, poked his head around the door and said, I've got it, chaps. I've got the name for the band. He said, oh, yeah. What is it this time, Giza? And he said, Black Sabbath. There's a pause. We all sort of looked at each other and nodded. There was no argument, no discussion. That was it. It just sounded right. The thing was that people like bands in those days and a lot of pop musicians before and since. They've attracted headlines for their extravagant lifestyle, shall we call them. But deep down, they were very talented musicians, weren't they? Sabbath were. The great thing about Sabbath was they were what Cam Basie called a one-beat band. They all knew exactly what to do, at, because they worked so hard. If you've got to think about the arrangement, if you've got to think about what's going to happen in the next chorus, you're not going to relax and play properly. They didn't have to think. When we put them in the, ham in the Star Club in Hamburg, people don't believe this now, it's true, uh, weekdays they did six 45-minute slots a night, 
Fridays and Saturdays, wow. they did eight. That was eight That's till four. Worth, eight till yeah, four, 45 on, 15 off. 45 on, 15 off. But you come back and to do what, two 45s or two one hour slots in England, it's a walk in the park. They were always a, 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 a real, like Spencer Davis Group, a real band. What was the moment when you, you thought, I think these, these guys could be really, really successful? I guess it came with a name change somehow. The name change is a jolt, it's a relaunch. You say, hey, we're not Earth anymore, we're Black Sabbath. And I think I stepped back and evaluated it then, and we'd just done that first slap in, ha in Hamburg, and, uh, and they were great. I mean, I, I, I know I offend a lot of Led Zeppelin fans out there, but we always felt ourselves in direct competition with Zeppelin. And in fact, our strapline was Black Sabbath makes Led Zeppelin sound like a kindergarten house band, which says it all really. But they had, they had all the southern softiness behind them. They, they got Peter Grant, who, who just broke up one band, got two of the members, put it together with two Birmingham boys, J J John and Robert. And, um, and they had an easy ride. They walked straight into a record deal. I went, to four, I went to 14 straight record companies, 14 no's I got on Black Sabbath's first album. And I went back again. I borrowed some money of David Platt's uh, Essex Music mm -hmm. on the basis of our success with Locomotive. And uh, he let, let money went straight. The same 14 comes out straight, 14 no's second time. I suppose one of the things is, Jim, that you have to change things just to keep up to date and to progress it. But there must be a great reluctance to do that, saying, well, it works, why, why should we? In music, things, a lot of things only work for a limited le length of time. There are exceptions, like Louis Armstrong, of course. Mm. And there's always young, young musicians coming through. I don't know how young musicians get to be as good as they are these days. They've got all those other diversions. I talk to their 3.1 close personal friends on Facebook every, every day. How do they find time to learn to play an instrument? But they do. There's a young, young guy who's um, debuted at the festival last year. Now he's on, on the jazz charts called, called Remy Harris. A stunning guitar player, 25 years old. He plays as well as any other guitar player around today. Um, a lot of the younger bands are picking up on the old styles. Thankfully not that British trad thing which has sort of weighed jazz down for so long, um, but other areas of jazz. Um, there's, there's a, a band called Whiskey Brothers who, who draw 1920s and 1930s sort of hokum, jug music. Good songs, played beautifully. Yeah. And I think in a way there's such a queue of young people coming th come through that the more established bands, they've got to look to their laurels, they've, they've got to keep being good. Yeah. If mum and dad are, are coming along to enjoy the music, and hopefully their children will as well, we have got all sorts of other bits for the children to do, haven't you, at the festival? Yeah, we've got um, 15 free music instrument workshops um, in conjunction with Birmingham School, uh, School of Music, sorry, Birmingham Music School. Um, We've got dance classes, Jitterbug and, and Lindy Hop, that is. We've got a pop-up dance hall at Regency Wharf off Broad Street on July the 4th, where uh, a double-decker bus pulls up, the side drops down, it becomes a stage. We've got two jump and jive bands and uh, Lindy Hop teachers and Chinese jitterbuggers and social jive as well. Um, we've, got a we've got a photographic project with um, free uh, free uh, masterclass in photography and on ongoing exhibitions of people's work. Whether experienced and, and veterans at it or just starters, it doesn't matter. It's, it's open, open to all. We've got ukulele, free ukulele classes in, in, a, in a coffee bar in, in Brindley Place. Again, for all levels. You don't even have to bring a ukulele. The ukuleles are, are surprised. Uh, are su surprised? They probably are surprised by, Supply, by the, yes, the low yeah, level of yeah, the, yeah. the musicianship. So, I mean, if you think back, you know, 31 years ago, it was a fairly simple affair, as you said, 850 people turned up. I mean, it has grown into something. I mean, it must take up pretty well all of your time, the organization of this, doesn't it? Well, we, we are Big Bear Records, and it's, it's a major project, but we are a recording company. I know people don't realize they what recording co companies are anymore, but there used to be stop plates in the high street called record stores. You'd go in and buy lots of beautiful music from but, um that was supplied by record companies. Well, we're still one. We still make records. We also have a magazine we publish, but Jazz Festival takes up probably 60, 70 percent of our year. But when it all comes together, it's terrific stuff, isn't it? Third to the 10th of July. Uh, all you really need is, is the weather, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Yeah. How much, uh, no pun intended, how much of a dampener does it put on things if, if you do get rain? Logistically, it's, it's a real pain because it, mm. everything's slowed down. People lo loading gear onto vehicles and driving places take longer in the rain. There's more traffic on the road 
when it rains. People still come out in, in the numbers, but they don't flit around. The great thing about the jazz festival is you, you go to a pub on Broad Street, you sit there for one set, have a glass of beer, walk up the road 10 yards to another pub, hear a different well, band. another one. Yeah. It's but, great stuff. Jim Simpson, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Let's hope the sun shines for you during the whole of the festival. And that's, uh, that's where we, we leave it for this morning.